Hello, this is Dr. Steve Johnson, and I am lecturing on short term counseling. This is module five, in which I will be discussing the flow of an REBT session, inference chaining, and debating uh, irrational and unhelpful uh, beliefs. First, let's look at the um, flow of a typical REBT session. Um, in order, of course, to open the session, um, of course, the, the um, therapist or the counselor does not set the agenda. We give that kind of uh, freedom and responsibility to the client. So we typically ask something along the lines of what would you like to work on in this session or what would you like to focus on? And then the typical order in which we do things, because Remember, we are wanting to get the ABC, so go back and study the components of the ABC model. And the order in which we do this is um, pretty straightforward. So remember, the A would be the uh, situation or the event um, where we're trying to get the uh, critical activating event. Um, C would be the consequences, the emotions and behaviors, and then B would be those beliefs, typically what we'll be working on are irrational or unhelpful beliefs that give rise to dysfunctional emotions and, um, and behaviors. So when we ask a client what they want to work on, typically they'll either choose the situation with which they're having trouble, or which is the A, or they will look at some kind of emotion or behavior that's causing a problem. Um, Rarely will they just jump in and say, oh, I'm holding an irrational belief. Uh, I don't think I've ever had a client do that. But um, so the order, if the if the client starts with a situation, which would be the A, then from the A, we try to go to C. We may say, uh, what were you feeling? What would uh, better? What emotion were you experiencing? about that situation or that event. So we've gone from the A and we're seeking C. <laughs> Once we get the C, then we can move to the B. How we do that, we'll be talking about in, um, in this uh, recording. If the client says, you know, I'm just really angry or I'm very depressed, then they've opened with the C. And then we might say, and what are you angry about? Or what are you depressed about? Then we're asking about the A. Once we have the A and the C, then we can move to the B. But don't forget, um, in one of our uh, recent um, uh, videos, we looked at getting the critical activating event, not just the activating event, but the critical activating event, that part of the activating event that is most related to the client's present disturbance. Once we get the um, that activating the you know the critical A, we want to make sure not this is not sequentially, but um, in terms of actions, we want to make sure that we've identified the primary emotion and behavioral symptom that the client wants to focus on in that session, and be sure that when you are doing that, uh, when you're trying to identify an emotion you actually identify an emotion rather than a thought. Uh, in English, sometimes that can be a challenge because of the word feel. The word feel sometimes means an emotion, but other times we use the word feel to signify a thought or a belief. Um, be sure that you also acquire a secondary symptom. Remember, a secondary symptom is a symptom about a symptom, like if I have anxiety and I'm depressed about anxiety, then depression would be my secondary symptom. And then within the session, be sure that you deal with one symptom at a time and don't bounce around to symptoms. If there are several symptoms that they mention, like several em emotions or an emotion and behavior, then you ask them, which one would you like to focus on in the session and then go with, um, with that one. So 
uh, just mentioned that it's important that we don't, because of that word feel, that we don't confuse a thought with an emotion. Because in the ABC model, the C is about an emotion, you know, and a behavior, but uh, particularly emotion. So we want to make sure that we uh, correctly identify what emotion they're experiencing. So if you're attempting to identify that emotion, don't do the following. Never, ever, ever ask how a situation made them feel. One, um, we don't want people to think that way. They usually already think that the A causes the C. And we don't want to reinforce that because if they believe that a situation causes their emotion, then they don't take responsibility for that. And so what we want is the BC connection so that they realize that they have not only some responsibility, but the power to actually change that emotion or that behavior that may be dysfunctional. So don't ask how that situation made them feel. Never, ever, ever do that. Um, don't ask how they feel. Don't even use that word feel because in English, the word feel is used to refer to a thought or an emotion. And um, let me give an example of confusing a thought with an emotion. <coughs> Excuse me. If a counselor or therapist has asked how the client felt when his wife filed for a divorce and the client responds, I felt like she hates me. Well, if the therapist, the therapist, if, if they're REBT, really are trying to get at an emotion here. But because they use the word feel and feel can mean a thought or an emotion, then the client responds with a thought. I felt like she hates me is not an emotion. So um, uh, that's a problematical. So uh, I would uh, caution you from using that word feel. If you want an emotion, ask for an emotion. It doesn't mean you'll get it, but it'll increase the likelihood of that. If they do identify a thought rather than an emotion, simply don't make a big deal out of it. Don't give them a big lecture simply respond and when you thought that what emotion did you experience so in this case i might say and when you thought that she hated you what emotion did you experience okay so i'm just kind of correcting it gently and then moving to try to maximize the possibility that i can get an emotion from this particular client so how do we check for a secondary symptom i said that we always want to check for a secondary symptom well Let's say you're a counselor or therapist and you've already helped the client identify that they're anxious about losing their job. And you want to see whether there's a secondary symptom there. Well, you could do something like this. You could say, do you have any emotions about the fact that you're anxious about losing your job? And if the client says, yeah, I'm angry that I even have to put, I have to be put in this situation, then that secondary symptom is anger about the fact, not the face, about the fact that they are um, anxious, okay? So the primary symptom is anxiety and the secondary symptom is the, um, is the anger. So let's move to this very, very, very important set of actions that we take so that we can identify the irrational and unhelpful beliefs. Because remember, those irrational and unhelpful beliefs are a major cause, not the only, but the major direct cause of the dysfunctional emotions and behavior. So it is essential that we try our best to uncover them. So here's some general points about doing this. For each emotional or behavioral symptom, it is important that you identify all the relevant irrational or unhelpful beliefs. Often with kind of new counselors, if they get one irrational, unhelpful belief, they go, oh, I got it. No, you don't. You need to get all the, all the relevant um, um, uh, irrational and unhelpful beliefs. That means the demandingness, the awfulizing, catastrophizing, the frustration intolerance, and the global negative um, uh, rating, okay? You need to look to see whether they're, all of those are present. And since with every dysfunctional emotion and behavior, there is a demand, it is important to go specifically to go looking for the demand. Um, demandiness is the core disturbance-producing belief. In addition, though, we want 
um, in addition to the demand, we want to try to identify all the relevant derivatives. So those derivatives, remember, are awfulizing or catastrophizing, uh, frustration intolerance, and global negative rating of, um, um, of self, others, life, and the world. Now, not all of them are going to be present for every um, emotional or behavioral disturbance, but we want to check out the presence of all of them, okay? And don't stop until you get them. So um, how to seek an IB? IB simply means irrational or unhelpful belief. Once you've identified an emotional or behavioral symptom, then the next step to move toward helping the client to identify the unhelpful or irrational belief is as follows. You might say, what were you telling yourself about you know, the situation and you name the situation, what were you telling yourself about the situation that caused you to be, and then put in the emotion, angry, anxious, depressed, or if it's not an emotion, it's behavior, to do what? Yell, scream, uh, avoid, whatever, okay? Uh, an example, what were you telling yourself about getting fired that caused you to be anxious, okay? We would not say, um, uh, how did getting fired cause you to be anxious? No, because that's an AC connection. But if we ask, what were you telling yourself about getting fired that caused you to be anxious? That's the BC connection that we're looking at. Um, instead of asking, what were you telling yourself? You could say some other kind of uh, phrase that means the same, pretty much the same thing. You could say, what were you thinking about that situation that caused that particular um, emotion, okay? What were you telling yourself? or what were you, um, what were you uh, thinking, okay? Those are two really good ways to help move. You've already got the A, you've already got the C, and now we wanna move to the B, and this is one of the best ways to go about um, doing so. So, um, in recent uh, video, I really went into detail on the REBT theory of emotions, and remember, um, remember that because that theory is going to be instrumental in the counseling for the rest of the course and then I hope in your life if you ever use this short-term model. And that theory was going to help you navigate through helping, uh, helping an individual. So don't forget it. Study it, memorize it, and practice it, okay? Don't forget the information in the theory of emotions. Why? Because remember, for every emotion, helpful or unhelpful, we looked at what the inferences were, what the beliefs were, and the action or behavioral tendencies for that particular um, emotion. Once we know that for an emotion, and we can hypothesize then about the inferences, beliefs, and <clears throat> the action or behavioral uh, tendencies, so that when the client we finally identify the emotion with the client, we can already form a hypothesis about those other factors in their presence. And if the client has difficulty with that, we can help them identify that. The REBT and CBT are theory-driven models. And so it is extremely important for you to have the aspects of that theory. Now, Knowing what the theory of model uh, of emotions is means that you can form a hypothesis. Do not, do not, do not assume that when you're talking to a client that simply because you have the theory of emotions that you absolutely know the inferences, beliefs, and action potential. It is very important that you get that from the client and you assume nothing. You've got to be very diligent about posing questions to get that kind of information from your client. So let's say, for example, that a client identifies anxiety as the emotion. Just from knowing anxiety and assuming that it is indeed anxiety, and we would have to check that, and we would check that by seeing whether that emotion is um, sabotaging to the client in one of the domains personal, interpersonal, professional, or spiritual domains. Um, if, it's, if it's not dysfunctional in those ways, then it's not anxiety, okay? Uh, or any other uh, unhelpful negative emotion for that sake. But assuming that it has been correctly identified, 
we can hypothesize then that if it is anxiety, that the inference that the client has is that there's a threat to the individual, okay? Uh, so that's important. Um, we can also hypothesize that there's a demand because there's always gonna be a demand with a dysfunctional emotion. And then we know that um, it's quite typical for uh, individuals who are anxious to have as their derivative unhelpful or irrational belief as um, frustration and tolerance. That's gonna be there in more than about 99% of individuals with anxiety. And then they may have awfulizing or some kind of global um, negative evaluation of something. And then we know what the action or behavioral potential or tendency is for someone with anxiety and the action associated with anxiety is avoidance. And so we will already know that at the level of hypothesis and then we can help uh, move things along by checking out, checking that out. You're not in the dark, you, you know quite a bit. Not only knowing this, we know when it gets to treatment and we're not quite there yet when we're looking, um, today we'll look at dis disputation or debating, but we won't be looking at other kinds of interventions. But when we do, we, since we would know what the uh, action or uh, behavioral um, um, uh, tendency is, that we could come up with a behavioral intervention that helps move someone away from avoidance and getting them exposed. So often some kind of exposure therapy. So don't forget this theory of emotion. It is crucial and you will need to use it and you'll need to use it in some assignments. I will ask you what the probable um, inference uh, beliefs and action potentials are. And don't just make it up because then you'll get it wrong, right? You need to go back to the um, theory. What if, though, when we ask the client about a situation and the emotion that they have in that situation, um, we ask them what were they telling themselves that, um, that about that situation that was causing the emotion, um, they don't give us a belief. In fact, let's say they just give us, they give us an inference instead of a belief because they don't know, clients don't know that we're looking for a belief. They're just gonna tell you what they were thinking and they may very well have thought an inference. So if you ask them that question and you get an inference, then at that point, as soon as you get the inference, there's a special process that you kick into, a process that you're going to uh, need to do so you can help the client move from the inference to the belief because it will be the belief that is the direct cause of the emotion, the dysfunctional emotion, not the inference. Remember, we could have one inference, multiple beliefs about associated with the one inference, and those beliefs will cause differentially a different um, uh, an emotion. So it's really uh, imperative that we identify the belief. But the question is, how do we move from an inference to uh, help the client move from the inference to the belief? That's what uh, the process that we do is called inference chaining. So uh, I'm gonna give you what that process is and uh, please uh, practice that. So there's a structure to the inference chain and it is imperative that you follow this structure without deviation. If you deviate from the structure, it's confusing for the client and you won't get the information that you're seeking, which is the belief. So what we do when someone gives us an inference, and remember an inference is either true or false, and they, but it's their inference, and we just hypothetically assume that their inference is true, right? We don't argue against an inference, just assume that it's true. Now some, if we're talking to our friends, we go, oh, you know, that's not true. Um, okay, fine, but that is not good therapy. Um, what we want here is to assume that the inference is true, right? That the threat, for example, with anxiety, that the threat is really there, okay? And then ask, what are you telling yourself about that being true that is causing you to be, and then name the emotion, for example, a client is anxious about getting fired. And then the 
the the counselor says, well, what are you telling yourself about getting fired that has you become anxious, right? That's how we try to get the belief. But the client responds saying, I'm telling myself that I may not be able to pay the bills. Well, that's not a belief. That's not a demand. That's not authorizing. That is not frustration tolerance. That's not a global negative evaluation, right? It is the meaning that they're giving to um, the interpretation they're giving to the situation. And when you give an interpretation or the meaning, that's an inference. And that is exactly what they've done. They've given us an inference. So we can't stop there. We have to take that inference and then try to get uh, the belief. And so the inference chain would be like this. We would take that inference that they said, I'm telling myself that I may not be able to pay the bills. And we'll go, well, let's say that's true. Let's say that you won't be able to pay the bills. What are you telling yourself about that that is causing you to be anxious? That form is essential. Assume that the inference that they say is true. And then you say, let's say that that inference is true, right? But state the inference, don't just say that it's true. Let's just say that, you know, whatever the inference is, state it. What are you telling yourself about that that is causing you to be anxious, okay? And then they might respond, I have to pay my bills. It, it'll be horrible if I, if I couldn't. Well, there they've given us uh, a fine, they've given us a belief. In fact, they've given us two beliefs. Uh, I have to pay my bills. Remember that's a demand. Demands usually have signal words like should, ought, must, or have to, which is in the case here, I have to pay my bills. And it would be horrible if I couldn't. So that's a demand plus uh, awfulizing or catastrophizing, okay? So that's the inference chain. Assume that the inference is true, right? And then ask them, about that inference, what are you telling yourself, you know, about that inference, if it's true, that would have you, for that particular situation, uh, what, that would have them uh, experience whatever the dysfunctional emotion is, okay? Study this. This is the formula that you absolutely have to use and don't deviate from uh, that. If you deviate from it, then you'll get something that's not moving you toward a belief and it'll just be confusing. So memorize the um, memorize the formula. I don't have you memorize much in this course, but an inference chain is one that you can't play with. This is not one you want to deviate from. When do you stop the inference chain? Because you may do the inference chain, but let's say in that previous client that I just had, that instead of giving me the demand and the um, awfulizing, which are beliefs, they just gave me another inference. Well, I can't stop. I have to do the inference chain again on that particular inference. Assume that that inference is true and then ask what were they telling themselves about that that is causing them to experience in the emotion. Okay, so let's say you've repeated that. Um, but don't repeat that process longer than two or three times because if you do, it is really confusing to the client and they get really frustrated and it's not going to help go anywhere. So after two or three times, you use, this is where you absolutely need to know the theory of emotion. You use your knowledge about the theory of emotions and you ask something such as, notice, some people in your situation when thinking about the prospect of not being able to pay bills might believe that this would be horrible and that they couldn't stand it. Do you have either of those thoughts? Okay, where's that coming from? It's coming from the most probable beliefs that an individual has who's anxious, okay? Now, some people go, but am I leading them? Well, this is, yeah, if you're doing out of the blue stuff and just making things up, you are really leading them in, in, um, in, 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 in really in an uninformed way. But this is, we're using the most probable beliefs and we are helping them move in that direction. There's no, Im no um, imperative that they accept either one of these and then we would have to begin to look at alternative means to identify those beliefs. The only time when we need to be really cautious about this would be if the person has a dependent personality disorder and if they have that disorder, then um, then they may automatically agree with you even if they don't agree with you, okay? Because they wouldn't want to, they would be afraid to offend you. Um, most people are, you know, the percentage of dependent personality disorders is fairly low in a society. And so occasionally you, uh, if you think that's the case, then you probably won't go in this, uh, 
in this uh, direction, right? Um, or you'll phrase it in really non-committal um, kind of language, okay? But in most of the cases, this is going to be, you know, way over 90 some percent. This is going to be absolutely okay. So let's move to the heart of the matter here. And that is, how do we debate irrational or unhelpful beliefs? Now, um, sometimes debating may sound like rude, but we don't, it's not a rude process. Keep in mind that we are giving them a skill. We're not pushy about it. Um, well, maybe unless, you know, when I'm in New York, sometimes I'm pushy. If I have like a fellow New York, pushy New Yorkers that I'm, that I'm counseling, but it doesn't have to be that way. And it's certainly never done rudely. And it's always done with great respect. And we're, clear with the client, we're just trying to change some beliefs so that they have more freedom, have more options in life, less dysfunctional emotions, and increase happiness and greater productivity in attaining those goals that are really, really important to, uh, to them. We're not saying something is wrong with them. We're just tweaking their, um, tweaking their beliefs to make them more fun, you know, um, enjoy life more. So, here are the things, important points to know right up front when we're going to be de uh, debating their irrational beliefs. Debate only one at a time. Don't try to debate more than that at any time. Otherwise, they get it gets messy and confusing. Stick with the belief and get a clear and specific belief and not a general one, okay? Um, so for example, some people go, um, it would be horrible if my children didn't like me, okay? And some therapist suddenly changed that client's belief. Remember, notice the client said it would be horrible if my children didn't like me. And so we go, oh, so you're believing that it would be horrible if people didn't like you? That's not what they said. You just made the belief more general. The client said that it would be horrible if their children that. So don't go more abstract. Get this one and get and deal with it at the same level of concreteness that the client uttered, okay? After we've got this done and we've settled it and helped d debate that particular belief, we may test later on whether they have general and actually think that many people or most people have to um, like them. But that's not what they brought up and we're going to stick with what the client says and not change it on them. Okay. So you got to be careful on that one a little bit. So here are the types of debates. Okay. And I've put them kind of in the order that we do them, except for the friendship debate. And I put that at the end because there is a case when we don't use it. Okay. Um, but otherwise it would be higher up on the hierarchy. The one that we use typically first, and more commonly, and that tends to work with most clients, is the pragmatic or functional debate. So once we have the irrational belief, and remember demandingness, catastrophizing, frustration intolerance, or global negative evaluation, rating, then we're going to pose a question to them. How is holding that specific belief helpful to you? And so they may look at you like you're a little bit off because they were like, nobody poses that question to them. How is it helpful for you to be thinking that way? For example, how is it helpful for you to believe that you're a total loser? What do you get out of that? And so if you ask this question, they'll go, well, wait a minute, it's, it's not helpful. It's not helpful at all. So, um, but you know, nobody's really posed that to them before. Well, we don't stop there. We try to do all of these, okay? because we never quite know which of the disputes is going to work more for any given client. So try them all. And then over time, you'll know which ones tend to work best for the client. The client will often tell you. Um, the empirical dispute is we ask, what's the evidence that supports the belief? What evidence do you have that, uh, that supports your belief? So if, they, if, you, if they, um, they say, I'm just a total loser, then you go, where's the evidence that you're a total loser, that you can't walk, you can't chew gum, you don't know how to eat, you can't do your job. I mean, that was what a total loser would be, right? 
And then they go, well, no, no, no. And then like, so, oh, you mean, so you don't, you're not a loser in everything, but sometimes you make mistakes in some things, right? So that's what we're trying to move them toward, okay? Um, to show them that sometimes they have a very exaggerated and, and global kinds of uh, unhelpful beliefs. And then the other one is logical. Ask how it follows that because a client wants something to happen that it must, okay? How does that logically follow? Now, let me just be very clear. The logical dispute doesn't work for a lot of people, but sometimes we can't predict um, for whom it does. We do know that some individuals that are very logically driven, like some scientists or engineers and individuals like that, may uh, like the logical dispute. Some people hate it. Some people who, um, you know, like just um, non-scientists, non-engineers, they'll just go, wow, yeah, that one really works for me. This is why we try all of them. And then there's another one that frequently, wor frequently works with individuals who are really hard on themselves, okay? Um, but they're nice toward other people. Really beat up on themselves, but are really gracious toward others. Um, and this is called a friendship dispute. This is where we ask the client what they would tell a what would they tell a friend, um, uh, a client or a friend who had the same uh, belief. Usually, we will say a friend rather than client. What would you tell a friend who had the same belief that you have right now? What would you tell a friend if they said they're a total loser? Would you go, "Yeah, you know, I've been meaning to tell you, you are a total loser." No, you wouldn't say that. And why not? Well, it would be rude. And then we like, well, why do that to yourself? How, you know what I mean? Um, if you wouldn't do that for a friend, and sometimes Albert Ellis say, what makes you so special, but that the rules that apply to the friends don't apply to you. Now, there is one time when we do not use the friendship dispute, and that is with anger. Why? Well, I talked about anger, and we believe, and sometimes angry people believe that they're justified in their anger. They're really focused on that. So that if we say, what would you tell a friend who's thinking that? I, and the angry person would say, yeah, you're right. I'm, I absolutely agree with you, you know? So that's not gonna work. So don't use this one on an individual who's really struggling with, um, with anger, okay? So let me give some example. Let's say a client has this unhelpful belief that they couldn't stand it if they lost their job, okay? So we're gonna use all of these um, disputes in this example with them. So we might say the pragmatic or the functional dispute would be, well, how's it helping you to tell yourself that you can't, st you couldn't stand it if you lost your job? And well, but isn't it true? And I'm going, well, yeah, but how is it helpful for you to keep telling yourself that? See, slow that one, most people go, well, yeah, it's not helpful, okay? But while, once we do that, then move to the empirical one. Where's the evidence that you won't be able to stand losing your job? I understand, you know, that um, it's going to be unpleasant. You might feel down, but where's the evidence? Do you have any whatsoever that you couldn't stand it? You, you know, you're going to fall on the ground and we're going to have to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. That it, wait, no. So that's kind of an exaggeration, right? And then we would do a logical dispute. How does it logically follow that because it would be it would be unpleasant to lose a job that you absolutely couldn't stand it? How do we jump from it would be really unpleasant um, to you absolutely can't stand it, right? Okay, and then the friendship. Let's say you had a friend who says that they couldn't stand it if they lose their job. Would you say that there's no way they're going to be able to stand it? You go, no, I wouldn't say that to them. I would say, and you know, if it's a friend, I'd tell them, yeah, it might be rough, but let's think about some things that you could do. You know what I mean? Let's think about, you know what I mean? And so um, we wouldn't want to hold them to that, but then we do it to ourselves, right? So try a combination. Usually it's a good idea to start with the pragmatic or the functional and the empirical. And then I often see with like Christians, I will use the friendship dispute in addition to the others because Typically, a, a, a good Christian is often harder on themselves than they are others, and so the friendship is uh, dispute is pretty good. Don't do it with anger, though. Don't do it with anger. And then logical, try it out. But I'll just tell you that statistically, uh, it's a smaller number of people who find that one more helpful than others. But there are some, and we don't know a priori, right? Uh, we don't know until we try it which one uh, for which clients it's going to um, it's going to work. 
not only are the, those are the types, but then there's the style that we have in using a debate. And, um, and for each of those debates, pragmatic, uh, you know, empirical, logical, or friendship, we can do it in a different style. Um, and the, you know, I've given you four of those. The two major ones are the Socratic and the didactic. The Socratic style poses the dispute in the form of a question. Now, in that last slide, in that example that I used of those, I did those in the form of questions. So the style I did that in was uh, Socratic. And I did that for a reason. Uh, we counselors and therapists love to use the Socratic kind of style in the debate, you know, which is really a challenge to their dysfunctional belief, because the client is more engaged. The question engages them and they respond to it, uh, which is good. We want more engagement from the client and for them to think about it and wrestle with it. But sometimes that doesn't work. The client can co can't come up with it, right? Or sometimes there are really concrete thinkers that, and the Socratic style doesn't work with them. So we will go didactic. That means instead of posing a question, we do it in the form of a statement. Okay, and I'll give an I'll give examples of this, and then there's a humorous humorous kind of style, uh, but honestly, we we don't do we don't use humor as a style um, until we know the client quite well because humor is a matter of taste and you never know and if you use it wrong you can really offend a client so know the client really well. Always direct the humor at the belief and not the client. We're not, we don't want to any way look like we're making fun of the client, just a way of thinking. And because um, some people with personality disorders will take um, that humor directed toward their belief as um, us making fun of them, that for some uh, conditions, uh, for example, like uh, borderline personality disorder, sometimes, not all, um, will take it as a personal attack. And some people that don't even have a personality disorder will take it as attack. They may just not, you know, be like, kind of like humorous individuals. Um, so it might be really merited to be extremely careful about using this. And then there's metaphor and story. In fact, I often use that with, uh, with clients. For example, um, I think I did this in the book that I, I wrote that is assigned for this course. Um, for um, anxiety um, and the dysfunctional action potential with anxiety, um, you know, which is avoidance, I typically will talk about the book of Jonah, right? So, you know, Jonah's got this bad assignment where he has to go to Nineveh and Nineveh, the Ninevites were the traditional enemy of the Jews. And so he has to go tell them to repent. Oh, well, that's not a great assignment. You know what I mean? And so um, he doesn't want to do it. And so he avoids, right? And hops on a ship to Tarshish and, oh, all kinds of trouble happen. And he gets thrown overboard and swallowed by a fish. Okay especially a portion of great big fish. And so um, clearly he's engaging in avoidance behavior. We can hypothesize about why. He's his inference is that there's a threat. Going to Nineveh is a threat. And therefore he was thinking, I shouldn't do this. It's not, you know, and then he might think this is, God's just being really unfair by giving me this. This is terrible. This is horrible. I can't even stand this. So those beliefs are what he has that lead to his, um, avoidance. But the, the, the story kind of gives very concretely uh, the picture that avoidance is not always good and can get you in more hot water. So I find telling that story is really good. And then also, also later on, it's a great story for looking at anger, you know, because Jonah gets angry enough to want to die. And so it's a really good story. So often you can pick stories out like, um, uh, Outlet like that. Um, so a metaphor story can be really good, particularly if you tap into something that is in the tradition of that particular of that particular uh, client. Let's give an example. 
uh, of a Socratic versus a didactic one. Um, and this is for that same individual who said they couldn't, uh, couldn't stand it if they uh, lost their job. So Socratic, we, I might say, how is it helping you to tell yourself that, right? Didactically, I wouldn't ask the question. I would put it in um, a straightforward uh, sentence statement. How many people, um, many people might think that while losing their job would be really bad and highly inconvenient, you know, maybe even filled with lots of problems, but they would be able to stand it. Do you think you would most likely be, would that most likely be the case for you? So notice that instead of asking that, I'm kind of put something in its place. Where did I get that? All from the REBT theory of emotion. So this is the didactic uh, um, style really kind of presupposes that you know the theory of emotion. So this is, again, another good reason why you need to make sure that you spend some time and understand that model. So also, my research for years and years of my life has been working with different religious groups and within their religious tradition, finding uh, sources that are authoritative for in the religious tradition to function as a dispute or a debate of unhelpful or irrational beliefs. So um, the little book that you have is one of them that I've written on, on that. And it is about using, in the book, it talks about using scripture to do that. So read that. I'm not going to be lecturing on that because it's all spelled out very clearly in that book. Uh, so using scripture, particular verses that will dispute um, the client's unhelpful belief. Uh, there's also an ABC structured prayer in there where we use prayer to structure, um, you know, a, a, a debate of what the individual, uh, the individual's unhelpful um, belief, right? Uh, later in the course, I'll tell you about an experiment that we did it at uh, CIU that used ABC structured prayer to help students overcome anxiety and it was really uh, the, the results were really amazing to be quite honest uh, they're going to be published in a journal fairly soon so these debates using scripture and maybe structured prayer i've discussed in detail in that book but here's one thing i want you to know uh, even as you begin to think about this um, what i've devised is and i'll, and I'll post it in canvas are sheets that if the client is demanding that there are particular verses that you can use so they're anti-demanding verses uh, same with frustration intolerance anti-frustration intolerance um, um, you know verses but the important thing is that when you choose the scripture and many clients get this wrong many therapists get this wrong um, and i've done and i've tried to teach uh, and, and i've taught this in churches and invariably at the very beginning, they'll make mistakes on this, but then they begin to learn and they do really quite well. Many people will choose the verse to counter the irrational belief, but it doesn't really dispute or debate the belief. They choose a verse that will make that person feel better. But the uh, feeling better because you've recited scripture might be nice, but it will not get at, it won't challenge and change the dysfunctional belief. We need to be sure that whatever the verse is that is chosen, either by the therapist or by the client, that it actually is a direct logical counter or debate of the belief that they have there. So, um, so for example, someone who has anxiety and they're thinking, um, uh, this is a horrible threat and I can't stand it. So those are their beliefs. So we would want to choose scripture that would directly counter that. Some people would say, well, uh, I, here's a verse for him. Cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Well, nice verse, but it doesn't change the belief. It doesn't get at what the belief, the dysfunctional belief is and change it. It just tells you to cast all your anxiety. The other thing is clients don't know how to do that. So fortunately, we've done some research to show how to do that. But um, see what I mean? It needs to directly counter. The scripture verse needs to counter directly and show the illogicality of what the client is believing, not just feel good. Because the model 
is not to have people just feel better. We want them to actually get better and learn how to change their beliefs without relying too much on us, right? That they'll be able to do that. Well, I thank you very much. I hope you've learned something in this one. If there are any questions whatsoever, feel free to get a hold of me through, um, through uh, Canvas and uh, I can set up a time to discuss with you any problems that you may have about this. Okay, thank you and have a good day.